Hello, this is Kauri Gaur. Today's topic is consumer surplus. The concept of consumer surplus was first propounded by the French engineer Jules Dupuy in 1844 to measure the social benefits of public goods, but his work was not remembered. Then it was independently propounded by Marshall in his Principles of Economics published in 1890. These days, the relevance of the consumer surplus and producer surplus can be analyzed practically by many aspects. That is, if a producer wants more profit, it has to find out a new kind of product or the market where competition is less and the demand is higher so that it can earn more surplus. On the other hand, it is also helpful for the government to analyze the welfare effects of its policies on consumers that whether it is a consumer surplus behind the increase in the demand of government influence the area. The concept of consumer surplus has more importance in the field of economic theory and welfare economics. This also helps to government to frame the policies regarding tax. Now question is, what is consumer surplus? Marshall defined the consumer surplus as excess of the price which a consumer would be willing to pay rather than to go without a thing over that. Which he actually does pay is the economic measure of the consumer satisfaction. It may be called as consumer surplus. So, one can say that consumer surplus is the difference between what consumer is willing to pay for his or her preferred goods and what he actually pays. So, consumer surplus is assumed price minus actual price. Or we can say consumer surplus is equals to total marginal utility minus price into total number of commodities purchased. The concept of consumer surplus is derived from the law of diminishing marginal utility. As any consumer is purchasing or having more and more of any goods, its marginal utility goes on diminishing by every successive consumption of good. Moreover, consumer purchases the good at price where its marginal utility and price remains same. This shows that at the marginal level, whatever price consumer is ready to pay is equal to the price actually pays. But for previous units where consumer was getting more marginal utility, he was paying same price because in market price of the commodity remains same. This means consumer was willing to pay more for initial marginal units of the goods because he was getting more marginal utility but actually he paid less. But as subsequently marginal utility goes down as the law of diminishing marginal utility, consumers marginal payments and marginal utility becomes same and the need for further consumption becomes zero and also consumer surplus becomes zero. Moving ahead to measurement of consumer surplus by Marshall. Marshall tried to measure consumer surplus with the help of money. According to him, consumer surplus measures the extra utility of consumer he is getting by consuming certain amount of commodities over and above the market values of those goods. It is because of the law of diminishing marginal utility that consumer is getting more marginal utility than the marginal price paid for those goods. Let's understand this with the help of a table. In this table, it is shown that by consuming first unit of the commodity, consumer is getting marginal utility of 20 means it is worth rupees 20 to him. From the second unit, he derives 18 marginal utility that means he is ready to pay rupees 18 for that commodity. So same in the subsequent goods, he is getting marginal utility of 16, 14, then 12, then 10. Actually, consumer is not paying equal to the marginal utility because the market price is same all the time from the consumption of first good 
till sixth good. But he was getting different marginal utilities. This is because of law of diminishing marginal utility. Now, from the first unit, consumer is getting 20 marginal utility while price is only 12. So, we can say consumer is getting rupees 8 as surplus. Same with the second unit of consumption, consumer is getting 18 marginal utility and pays again 12. So, he is getting rupees 6 as a surplus and subsequently as he consumes more and more goods, consumer surplus goes down with marginal utility. So, according to Marshall, consumer surplus can be measured cardinally with the help of marginal utility and the money. Let us understand consumer surplus with the help of a diagram. In this diagram, we can see on x axis we have taken quantity and on y axis price and marginal utility are taken. At OP price, consumer is purchasing OM amount of goods. So, at point S, consumer is in equilibrium. In other words, we can say on point S, the consumer surplus becomes zero because at point S, the price consumer is paying for is equals to the marginal utility consumer is getting. In the diagram, the shaded area PDS shows the total consumer surplus. Let us begin with criticism of Marshall's consumer surplus. There are few fundamental limitations in the Marshall's concept of consumer surplus. First is, it is based on the utility analysis. So, it is incorporating the limitations of this analysis also. Second is, Marshall assumes that utility is measurable while according to Higgs, utility is subjective and can't be measured. Third is, Marshall also assumes that the marginal utility of money remains constant while actually utility of money changes as the quantity of money changes with the individual. Okay, let us take a glance of Hicksian consumer surplus. Seeing all these limitations of the Marshall's consumer surplus, Hicks has given the same concept of consumer surplus on the basis of indifference curve analysis through which Hicks is able to eliminate these limitations. In 1930, Hicks and Allen rejected this Marshall's theory and in 1940, they published articles in the Review of Economic Studies and tried to establish a new theory based on indifference curve. Here in this diagram of indifference curve, we can see DG is the line or we can say this is a price line on which indifference curve I2 is touching at point A, which shows that consumer is purchasing good Y of quantity OB at OC price. But actually how much consumer wants to pay that we have to decide. For that, we have to draw another indifference curve, which is I1 parallel to I2 consumer is ready to pay FD amount of money, but actually he pays CD amount of money. So, CF is the consumer surplus. So, this explanation is given on the understanding of keeping marginal utility of money constant. Now, what is producer surplus? Producer surplus is an analogous to the consumer surplus. If producer is able to sell its goods, on higher price than the minimum prices prevailing in the market, it will be considered as producer surplus. Or in other words, we can say that if producer sold its goods on higher prices, which he was ready to sell on lower prices, also will be considered its surplus earning. So, one can say that producer surplus is what extra producer is earning than its marginal cost per unit. Let us understand producer surplus with a diagram. Let us take an example how producers earn surplus through this figure. This figure we can see x axis the quantity and on y axis we can see price of the good. We have demand curve and supply curves also which also represent marginal revenue and marginal cost curves. As we can see initially, when the price is 1, which is lowest price offered by the producer, at this price, he is selling only Q1. Point A1 shows the situation where marginal cost curve is 
much below the marginal revenue and the producer is earning surplus of 3 rupees as the price increases from 1 to 2 seller is ready to sell q2 amount of quantity and seller is earning 2 rupees surplus at price 3 seller is selling q3 where he is earning 1 rupees as the quantity is increasing the surplus of the producer is decreasing and at point d1 firm is earning no surplus beyond that producer will not sell any goods because the marginal cost per production will exceed to the marginal revenue. Suppose if the goods are perfectly divisible, producer would get $8 as a surplus. We can also say as the price is changing, the producer surplus is also changing. Now let us take an idea about effects of taxes and subsidy. First is effects of taxes. Adam Smith, a pioneer classical economist, talks about the laissez-faire policy where he is no control of the government of the function of the market. So, the market does what it wanted to do and if something goes wrong, it corrects itself. So, these days it is almost impossible to find out a country where government intervention seems less important or negligible. So, changes in the market by government is possible through various instruments and two of them are taxes and subsidies. Through demand and supply analysis, one can explain the effects of taxes and subsidies. Here, we will discuss about the specific tax or we can say certain fixed amount of tax on per unit sold. Let us explain it with the help of a diagram. In this diagram, we can see when there is no tax imposition, consumer is purchasing Q quantity of goods at P price and E1 is the equilibrium point where demand and supply curve intersect each other. Now, let us see what happens after tax imposition. Also, there are some basic questions which must be answered such as who bear the tax and how much tax would be paid by buyers and sellers. In this figure, we can see that at P1 price, consumers are ready to purchase Q2 amount of goods as sellers are also agreed on that price. But as the tax T has been imposed and the price increased from P1 to P2, the quantity demanded reduced from Q2 to Q1 because consumers always care about what price they are paying for the goods. So, there would be reduction in the demand. On the other hand, seller is receiving P0 prices after the tax imposition and selling Q1 quantity of goods. Now, the tax paid by the consumer is showed as the shaded area N and tax paid by the seller is V and G and I are the deadweight loss. So, the government is getting tax T which is equals to area N plus V. This shows that consumers and sellers both are paying equal amount of tax and it is not necessary that both should pay the same amount of tax. It depends on the intensity of need for consumer to purchase goods or intensity of need for seller to sell the goods in the market. The concept of elasticity would be useful to decide that who will bear more or less tax burden. For example, if a demand is perfectly elastic and the supply is inelastic, then the seller would bear most of the tax burden. And if the demand is inelastic and supply is more elastic, then the consumer will bear most of the tax burden. So, we can say that impact of tax depends upon elasticity of demand and supply. If we assume the elasticity would remain same. So, the incident of tax will fall on consumer and producer equally. So, half of the tax burden would be paid by consumer and half would be paid by the producer. But it does not mean that always elasticity would remain same. In general, we can say that tax falls mostly on the consumer if elasticity of demand or supply is small and mostly on the producer if ED or we can say elasticity of demand or elasticity of supply is large. Next is effects of subsidy. Effects of subsidy can be analyzed as we analyze the tax. 
we can say subsidy is a negative tax and also has vice versa effects on the tax. For example, after imposition of the tax, the demand is decreasing, but after allotting subsidy, the demand is increasing. Why? This is because of subsidy. The actual price paid by the consumer is less than what he would have to pay without subsidies. Again, if we want to study this concept, we have to take an assumption. First is the elasticity of demand and supply roughly remains same. In this figure, we have taken quantity on x axis and prices on y axis. Demand and supply curves are intersecting each other at point C, which is initial equilibrium point when there is no subsidy allotted. At P0 prices, consumers are ready to purchase Q0 quantity of goods. Now suppose the price has been increased from P0 to P2, the demand will get reduced and if price decreased from P0 to P1, the supply will get reduced. So the subsidy has been given in which it is shown in the area S. After subsidization, the center of equilibrium would remain same, but consumers will get higher quantity of goods as same price P0 and seller would also get the price what they wanted to get. So at point P0, the benefit of subsidy is also shared equally between consumers and sellers, but it does not happen always that both share same benefits. It is again depends on the elasticity. Thus, we can summarize it as consumer surplus and producer surplus both are emphasizing on the importance of the marginal benefits and marginal gains. It also tries to solve the famous paradox of water and diamond. That is why selling water has fewer benefits while in diamond the benefits are much more because it ignores the value in use and only stresses the marginal utility rather than total utility. It is also an important part of cost benefit analysis where not only cost of project matters but the long term satisfaction derived by that project is also considered because it is an important tool of welfare economics. Thank you.